welcoming the dear brother Tivia Zaretsky who has come and shared the word with us, I think probably at least three times before over the 20 years that I've been here at St. John's. And Tivia is a founding leader of Jews for Jesus, a ministry that we are honored to be able to, to support today and encourage and bless. His special work right now and has been for some time is with Jewish Gentile couples, and there are many in the Los Angeles area. Tuvia has the special gift of bringing the Messiah Jesus close uh, to Jewish and, and uh, Gentile uh, friends and neighbors all around our city. And we welcome him today as he brings again a special word on this eve of Sukkot, and he'll tell you all about it. This is a very special time of year for our Jewish brothers and sisters and also for our Messianic Jews and, and also for us uh, as followers of Jesus who love the word, the Hebrew scriptures and all of the Bible, Jesus' special library. So we welcome two of you today. Two of you, thank you for sharing the word with us. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. And shalom. Uh, it's a joy to be back with you. My wife Ellen and I have um, a special relationship with St. John's. Uh, over the three, a little over three decades, we've lived here in Southern California. Our kids went to the preschool over here. Uh, our roots don't go nearly as deep as the banyan tree out there. But uh, we've got a great love for many of you that we know and, and have, have uh, rejoiced to be with. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about our ministry as I get started here, and, and then I want to dive into the Word of God. But I also want to, want to say how much I appreciate uh, Pastor Steve. Um, I have memories of being here uh, when we had a, a seminar not long after we'd come to Los Angeles, and uh, there was a, a fellow who was a, we call him an anti-missionary. He was an Orthodox Jewish guy who was really troubled by the idea that we were telling Christians that it was okay to share your faith with Jewish people. And he came down this aisle screaming, and we had quite an experience with him. We walked, I walked out with him, uh, dodged his car when he tried to run me down, thankfully. Um, and then uh, I, he was really, really angry, and, and I tried to communicate with him, and about, um, about eight years later, he contacted me. And he said, you know that, that day I was at St. John's Presbyterian Church? I was wrong. And He'd been working with Christians. There were two women who worked in the pharmacy where he was, was uh, employed. And by their lives, they had shown the reality of faith in Christ. It had so impacted him that he was so, and he was moved to come and repent. And Pastor Steve hadn't been here very long. I asked if he would receive this man's repentance. And we, we met for, for coffee, and, and Steve, you were so gracious to him. And I'm thankful for that. I'll never forget that. And it's just kind of bonded my heart as well. Another reason to have a bonding here. Um, oh, by the way, about a year later, I was sitting at a, at a coffee shop with this fella. And, and he said, do you think we're in the last days? And I said to him, Howard, if I'm sitting here in Jerry's Deli talking with you, an Orthodox Jew, about Jesus, we must be. So there's some really wonderful things happening. I, um, our, my message today is, is uh, titled, I Will Dwell in the Midst of You. And that'll be my, my focus here. If, if afterwards you wanted to get a copy of the message, um, just a written copy, I'll be glad to send it to you. There's an email on there. If you'd like to support the ministry, there's a, a giving code. Um, I'll show that again at the very end uh, if it goes by too quickly, but um, there's a way that you can stay connected. And then I'll be at the res resource table afterwards um, where we have some uh, information, both free and not so free, but especially a little booklet that I want to make sure I give you that uh, called uh, A Roadmap to Christ and the Seven Feasts of Israel. And if you give me my, your, your email address, I'll send that to you as a digital booklet. It's about 18 pages long that covers all seven of, of the feasts of Israel. But I'm so grateful to be here, so grateful, grateful to be here today. Uh, the theme for what we're, we're talking about here in that message, the title, Emmanuel, I Will Dwell Among You, gets at the question, is the Lord and Creator in a relationship with you, or are you in a devotion rooted around religion? For God, the, the Creator, wants us to have a, a deep and abiding relationship with Him. 
and to walk with him. From Genesis to Revelation, God has communicated to us this very simple threefold story of, of the gospel. It's in these three phrases. I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. That's repeated so many times from Genesis to Revelation. God has wanted a relationship with us. He wants us to walk with him, to know him, to be his disciples, to be engaged in our lives. I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. I will dwell among you. So beginning from the Garden of Eden, the creator God put man in his garden and, and, cult, and called him to cultivate that garden to produce fruit. And Adam got the hang of that, and then the Lord gave him a, a partner, Eve, so to, that together they could produce fruit and multiply. For that was his plan, that we would populate the world, and God would, would live with us and among us and fill us with fruitfulness. And they walked with him, they loved him as a father, they knew him, they conversed with him. That was until the fall. And their disobedience to God and the broken trust yielded sin along with a rotted spiritual fruit and physical death. But God in that moment pledged himself to restore that ruptured relationship. That was all part of his plan to create free creatures who could respond to him in freedom and love and know his loving kindness in an atmosphere and a spirit of total freedom. And so in Genesis 3.15, God promised to send the seed of a woman who could redeem the brokenhearted and release the captives of iniquity and restore their relationship with him at his appointed time. The seed of the woman who would come and defeat death while being wounded in the process, that seed of the woman promised long before was the promise of Jesus the Messiah. I call him Yeshua, or the Messiah Yeshua, Hamashiach Yeshua, Savior, who would be the seed of that woman. And God had a plan that would require a woman and a family and a tribe and a nation. And for that reason, he called Abraham a Chaldean, an Aramean, not yet a Jew, for it would come from his loins that this nation would, would rise through Abraham, then Isaac, and Jacob. But most importantly, Abraham realized that God had a design and a plan through his descendants, that God told him in Genesis 12, 3, that he would give Abraham a name, a great name, a name among the nations that we still revere and remember, a land a land to his seed, and the seed that would come from him, and in particular, one seed through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. There was the gospel all the way back in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. Abraham understood that, that covenant that was given to him. He related that to his children, who from then on told the story of what God's grace was all about. Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons who become the, the tribal heads. 70 of them with their families go down into Egypt. They dwell there for 400 years, and the nation grew to more than two and a half million. They are enslaved, and God in his plan sends Moses to lead them out of that slavery. As they come out of Egypt by the grace of God and the power of God displayed before the Egyptians, God sets them in an encampment in the Sinai wilderness. And just as Adam and Eve experienced God in his human presence as he walked with them in his, the glory of his deity, so the God of the nation now puts a tent, a Beit HaMikdash, a Makom Kodesh, a holy place in the middle of the Sinai encampment. And he tells them of this place in, in the book of Exodus, uh, sorry, the, the book of Leviticus. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you, and I will also walk among you, 
and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord. I am yud heh I am Yahweh. He gives them a name by which they can call him and know him. Your God. That temple, that, those services, that place, the seasonal rituals, were all the catechism, the Bible study, the spiritual training for the people of Israel. In Exodus chapter 25, he says, have them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. In Exodus 29, he says, and I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. And so the, taber, the tabernacle, the tent, stood, later becoming the temple, for 860 years, first in Sinai and then in various places around the land of Israel, and finally in the city of Jerusalem, erected as a temple by King Solomon. Every time people went there and they looked to that temple, God was saying to them, I will be your God. You will be my people. I will dwell in the midst of you. There it was, the holy temple, with the altar for sacrifices, a tent of meeting to fellowship with the people, rituals that told them their prayers were being heard and they were being prayed for. They were asked to come to the temple and be part of the, those rituals and, and services. I will be your God, you will be my people, I will dwell among you for those nine centuries. But those, that temple, those sacrifices, those services were for the discipleship of Israel. But Colossians tells us that they were, well, a foreshadow. Colossians uh, 2.17, there is a shadow, these are a shadow of things to come. But the substance belongs to Messiah. Everything that was there in that temple spoke about Jesus. Everything that was there spoke to them of God's desire to bring the people close to him, that they might understand that he is close to them and that he wants to make them fruitful even as he made Adam and Eve fruitful in the garden. My brothers and sisters, Paul tells us in this passage that those shadows set the stage for a reality that you and I walk in as a relationship with the living God. The kind of relationship that impacts our community, our neighborhood, our family, the people with whom we work, just as those women so deeply impacted the life of the man I told you about named Howard, who had, at one time stood against us. What did those shadows look like? Today we have a great opportunity. This very week, we are in the midst of the holy days of Israel, the high holy days. It all began on the first day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei, Sorry, the, the seventh month of, of uh, first day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. That was back on Labor Day. It was called Yom Truah, the day for blowing trumpets. And on that day, a trumpet blast was to be sounded from the temple in Jerusalem and sounded across the land. And that temple, that, that shofar, um, is a, a call to worship. And it was to go out from the temple to the cities around Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of uh, Israel and then on out into the diaspora. 586, the temple was destroyed. There is no longer a place to blow that from. But we blow it now to turn our hearts to God. That was the whole point of it. But on, and the people were called to go up to the city of Jerusalem to go to the temple in the ancient days. It was a reminder to turn to God and go and worship him at his house. But if you're on your way to the city of Jerusalem to have a, a joyous worship time with God, along the way you might wonder, you know, I wonder, is there anything in my heart that would be offensive to God for which I need to repent? God told the people, I have your backs. I have, you, I have this covered for you. And on the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei, God offered the Yom Kippur, a day of atonement. We just celebrated that last Wednesday night at sundown and through the following day, a day on which God would remove the conscious pain of guilt and the open wound of the stain of sin and shame. It was a, a day for a, atoning blood sacrifice at the temple. It foreshadowed the blood sacrifice of Jesus, 
God's gift for your sin and mine, for our guilt and shame on the cross of Calvary. King David, writing just before the temple was created, was built, wrote in Psalm 14, there is no one who does good, no, not even one. David could admit the universal truth that we are all broken. Every single one of us is. And until we know how deeply we are loved, it is so hard to admit that, which is why God already took care of that for the Jewish people at Yom Kippur and for all of us who look in on that sacrifice and recognize what God has done for us in the gospel of Christ at the cross. My mentor, Moish Rosen, used to say, if you ever feel far away from God, meditate on your sin. It'll bring you close to him. Because of what Jesus has done, we have that assurance. You can trust your God. He loves you. He saved you from death. And he wants you to be his. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will dwell in the midst of you. So that was last Wednesday on the Feast of Yom Kippur, and now we look ahead to tomorrow night, as Pastor Steve reminded us. Tomorrow night launches a week-long festival called Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And at that festival, Jewish people would ordinarily go to the city of Jerusalem. Now it's, it uh, has to be done in our homes because there's no temple uh, to address, but you and I can go and reflect, refresh our hearts to know that we are with God and He wants to dwell with us. It's typical in, in a Jewish home to set up a little, a little booth, a tabernacle, a sukkah, uh, and there's food, there's um, hospitality, there's uh, refreshment around the table. Uh, we would take our, our fruits and vegetables to the city of Jerusalem. Now we come to, the, to our homes. This is still done in Israel. This is a week-long holiday, very much like the season of, of Christmas time here in the United States. People shop and bring gifts to their friends. But there are two key messages in, in the Feast of Sukkot. Emmanuel, God is with us. As he was at the Sinai encampment day and night with the Shekinah glory, now God is with us, you and me, as we welcome him into the throne of our heart. He's there in the Holy Spirit. Emmanuel, God is with us. And secondly, coming from that whole understanding of the, the place of the Holy Spirit with us. He's there to make us fruitful. Just as we celebrated the fruit that came from the rain at Sukkot, we can now know that God has poured out his fruitfulness. Ruth, I appreciated the, the study on, on the uh, fruits of the Spirit, because that's exactly what, what Tabernacles was to teach us, those, that promise of his fruitfulness in our lives. The Lord gives the rain. And we remember how important that is to, to accomplish the fruitfulness of our land. But most importantly, he gives the well-watered spring, spring of salvation through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And now we can experience his fruitfulness by the Spirit dwelling in us. And we can see the substance of the Messiah shining through as he did and was promised in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfills the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was on that day, as we read in John chapter 7, that Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem. We read in John 7 that he was on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples. We read in John 7 too. Now the Feast of the Jews, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles was near. All the disciples went up to Jer Jerusalem minus Jesus. But when the but when it was now the middle of the feast, remember it's an eight-day festival, sometime between day four and five, Jesus goes up there. Jesus went up to the temple area, and he began to teach. So he goes into the temple um, courtyard, right there by that holy place, and he's there on a very important day. There's a seven-day festival culminated with uh, Hoshana Rabbah, the great day of salvation. The great day culminates that whole week, week long of worship. And on that day, the priests bring ewers filled with water, big pitchers. And they pour the pitcher water into the, this huge bronze laver, a bowl, perforated, so that when they pour it in, the water sprays out across the feet of the people. And I picture this happening as we read what Jesus taught on the great day of salvation. 
For in John 7, 37 to 39, it says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of maim chayim, living water. But this he said in reference to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Herein is the salvation plan of God. Emmanuel, God coming to dwell with us and in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus made us kosher by what he did at the cross of Calvary. He's our anointed redeemer, the seed of the woman, promised back in Genesis. And now he comes and the door is open for the Spirit to come in, into that holy place, into our lives. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit just came upon people who believed and departed. Came upon them and departed. He did that in Saul's life and some other people for the purposes of God. But now he comes into our lives and is indwelling and sealed within us. And for your response this morning, I ask two questions. In your journey into freedom, do you know Jesus, the wellspring of salvation? Are you thirsting for relief from the pain of guilt and the stain of shame? This morning, you can thank him for his salvation in Messiah Jesus. You can acknowledge that he saved you from the penalty of sin and spiritual death and spiritually be refreshed or spiritually born anew. Second, you can respond in your journey into freedom as a disciple calling for a deep relationship more than religion. Do you live with Emmanuel in faith, hope, and love on a daily basis? Perhaps today you might ask him to make you spiritually fruitful even more so. This morning you can do that with a simple four-letter word prayer. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. Let's take a moment and pray. In silent prayer, reflect on what God might have said to you in this time and respond to our Heavenly Father. Join with me in silent prayer, won't you? O Lord, you are our God. We trust in you. We are your people. We have worth in you. You dwell among us. We have spiritual fruit from you. Now the revelation of Messiah that Jesus promised Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Revelation 21.3. Maranatha and...